Hey everyone, what's up? It's good to see you. My name is Caleb. This is a channel called Theophile. Here we talk about books that talk about God and we talk about them kindly. I'm glad you're here. Okay, so I've been making some videos where I summarize and present the material in N.T. Wright's magnum opus, Christian Origins and the Question of God, or Coat Cog for short. In this video, we're going over the second volume in the project, The Blue Book, Jesus, and the Victory of God, or Jatvog for short. This volume is really where the project takes off. Wright is done with his introductory material, and now he's ready to to get into the weeds of New Testament studies. This book is divided into 14 chapters. The first four chapters are section one. They introduce you to the study. Then chapters five through 10 are about the profile of a prophet. They talk about how Jesus would have been understood as a prophet in his first century context. Then chapters 11 through 13 go from outside to inside of Jesus. They try to reconstruct his theology and psychology, the beliefs and aims of Jesus. Then chapter 14 is a conclusion including Samarial chapter, reviewing the material and setting you up for the next volume, which is about the resurrection. Let's jump into section one, chapters one through four, which introduce us to the topic. In chapter one, Wright says that when we ask historical Jesus questions, like how was he understood by his contemporaries? And who did he think he was? And why was he publicly executed on a Roman cross? There are two registers in which we can answer those questions, a historical register and a theological register. Wright then says something pretty pointed. He says there are many Christian scholars who really don't care about the historical register. For them, Wright says, it would be fine if Jesus was born of a virgin, lived in a cave, and then died for our sins. The actual historical nitty-gritty contours of Jesus' life, how he related to the polity of the people around him, how he related to a grand Jewish story, what he actually said and did, isn't as important as the main thing, which is Jesus being the subject of Paul's soteriology. Wright says that for some of these scholars, the Gospels are really just the chips and dip before you get to the meat of the Book of Romans. Wright then turns his gaze on a different set of scholars, whom he says only care about the historical register and are timid about ever talking about the theological register. And Wright says that is frankly silly. You can't study the historical Jesus while pretending he's not the center of the, of the world's largest religion. You have to deal with theology when talking about Jesus. And it doesn't matter whether you're a practicing Christian or a practicing Muslim or a practicing Jew or a practicing atheist. Theology comes into play when you study the historical Jesus, and we can't pretend it doesn't. This chapter reads like a splash of cold water. Wright wants to say that in the following chapters, as we study the historical Jesus, as we ask how his contemporaries understood him, what he believed about himself, and why he died on a cross, we are going to care about both the historical and the theological layer of truth. After that discussion about the relationship between history and theology. Wright then quickly rehearses the history of historical Jesus study. He takes us through the long parade of scholars who have written in the field in the past. Then he self-identifies and says where he fits in that parade, how he relates to the other scholars in the field, and what he wants his volume to contribute to the conversation. So now, let me summarize Wright's summary of the history of historical Jesus studies. The first period Wright covers is from the late Reformation period to the late 19th century. In those years, there were two kinds of books being written about Jesus. The first came from a very dogmatic, very ecclesial place. The purpose of those books was to tell Christians what they need to believe about Christology and need to believe about the atonement to go to heaven. The most famous book written in that vein was written by Francis Turretin. The other kind of book being written about Jesus in that period had a diametrically opposed purpose. And these books were called the Lives of Jesus. And these Lives books tried to say, let's get at the true Jesus behind the church and behind dogma. The most famous Life of Jesus was written by Herman Ramirez. Then at the beginning of the 20th century, Wright talks about two scholars who both deconstructed the dogmatic and the anti-dogmatic traditions which came before them. These men were Albert Schweitzer and William Reed, and from the pens of these scholars came books which thoroughly changed the game. First of all, they deconstructed the dogmatic tradition. They said, hey, you guys aren't really doing history. You're doing theology and Christology and soteriology, and that's fine. You can keep doing that, but you're not doing history. Reed and Schweitzer also pointed to those who were writing Lives of Jesus, and they said, isn't it funny that when you wipe away the dogma, the true Jesus of history looks a lot like us? And it's true. For a lot of those books that were trying to find the true Jesus of history, 
Jesus ended up simply being a student of Kant, or a student of Hegel, or a student of any one of the Enlightenment philosophers. The Oz behind the curtain, the Jesus behind the dogma, was really a European colonialist. Though both Schweitzer and Reed shared a criticism of the traditions which came before them, they then positively constructed who Jesus was in radically different ways. And Wright says that every subsequent historical Jesus scholar stands on the shoulders of one of these two giants. We are all driving on either the road paved by Schweitzer or the road paved by Reed, the Schweitzerbahn or the Riedebahn. That's an analogy Wright uses throughout the entire volume. Let's look at some of the distinctives of the Riedebahn, those scholars who follow William Reed. The first distinctive of this school is the idea that Jesus needs to be understood in fundamentally non-Jewish categories. Now, that's not to say they believe he was ethnically a Gentile. Everyone agrees Jesus was ethnically Jewish. What they're saying is that to understand the essence of his ministry, of his public life, you can't think of him as a Jewish prophet. And so some Reedian scholars have said we need to understand Jesus as basically a Greek philosopher, a peripatetic philosopher. And some have said he's a cynic, some have said he's a Stoic, some have said he's a Neoplatonist. Others have said we need to understand Jesus as basically just a political revolutionary. He was trying to reverse the tax laws levied by Rome, or he was trying to get back the Sea of Galilee from Caesar's control. It was all about real estate the whole time. Some have even said we need to understand Jesus as basically a Buddhist. We need to understand him in the categories given us by Eastern religion. A second characteristic of scholars driving the Ritabon is a basic distrust of the sources for Jesus' life in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They would say that there may be sprinkles of historical truth throughout those books, a saying or an action of Jesus here and there, but basically the canonical gospels should be understood as religious propaganda. Some of the most famous scholars to drive the Ritabon are Rudolf Bultmann, Burton Mack, John Dominic Crossan, and Marcus Borg. Also, the famous or infamous Jesus Seminar is thoroughly in the Reedian tradition. Now let's look at some distinctives of Schweitzer's approach to reconstructing the historical Jesus. First off, there's the idea that if we're going to understand Jesus, he needs to be thought of in basically prophetic Jewish apocalyptic categories. Jesus was a Jewish prophet who was talking about the kingdom of the Jewish God, and if we try to think of Jesus' ministry in any other category, we're just going to fundamentally misunderstand what he was about. Secondly, those who follow Schweitzer generally have a more optimistic view of the historicity of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, everyone recognizes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have been edited and redacted and expanded and theologized by the early church. But those who follow Schweitzer would say, if you want to know basically what Jesus did and said, you look at the largest extant biographies of him, which are the Gospels. Some of the most famous scholars to drive the Schweitzer bond are Ernst Ernst Kayserman, C.H. Dodd, George Caird, Ed Sanders, and now N.T. Wright. He self-identifies as a scholar following the way of Schweitzer. Here are Wright's reasons for siding with Schweitzer, not Reed. One has to do with the vicious circularity of Reed's method and the method of his students. And here's what he means. If you come to the sources, if you come to the material which talks about Jesus, already assuming you know the best context in which to understand Jesus, then you can simply simply sift through all the material and find the data which supports your hypothesis, then label all of the other data added or secondary literature. So for example, if you come to the material assuming the best way to think about Jesus as though he's basically a Buddhist, you can then sift through all of the material, find those sayings or actions of Jesus which seem to support your hypothesis, label that data as authentic, then label the rest of the data as inauthentic. A contemporary example of this is the book by Reza Eslan Zealot, which says Jesus was basically just a political revolutionary. He comes to the material knowing that's who Jesus must be. That's the ultimate context in which we should understand him. So then you can sift through the Gospels and the sources of Jesus outside of the Gospels, which paint him as a politician or having a political agenda, call that authentic, then label the rest of the material inauthentic, or second century additions to the Jesus tradition. Well, Wright would say that's all viciously circular. You came to Jesus already knowing who he was supposed to 
be, you made him in your own image. This problem is not shared by scholars who follow Schweitzer's position. We come to all of the material saying all of it, while authentic, is also under the influence of the early church, and we need to use as much of it as we can to reconstruct a historical picture of Jesus. The third argument Wright gives as to why we ought to side with Schweitzer over Reed has to do with the construction of the early church. It's basically this. If everyone in the early church says that Jesus did or said X, the best explanation for that is that Jesus did or said X. Because the Reedian position says that the early church invented a lot of tradition and then retroactively superimposed that on to Jesus, it's the Reedian position which is adding more steps to the historical process. It's better to cut the Gordian knot. Let me give you some examples to make Wright's argument a little more clear. The first generation of Jesus followers all understood Jesus to be teaching religious principles. He talked about prayer. He talked about how he himself had a special relationship with Israel's God whom he called Father. And Jesus believed himself to be playing an important part in the history of Israel's religious identity. The best explanation for why all of these first century people understood Jesus to be speaking in these religious terms is because Jesus probably spoke in religious terms. Those are the arguments Wright gives as to why we ought to side with Schweitzer as we reconstruct the historical Jesus rather than read. Hopefully this summary was helpful and hopefully I see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. See ya.